intended to. I would like to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar um, include those from the OCLC RLP, and we, so we thank you for your continued support and input into our work. Uh, these are crucial to our success. And now I'm delighted to turn things over to my colleague, Rebecca Bryant, uh, who will kick things off for us. Rebecca? Great. Thanks, Mercy. Hi, I'm Rebecca Bryant, and I'm going to be co-presenting today with, uh, with one of my co-authors, Jan Franson. Uh, and um, a quick thing about myself, I'm Senior Program Officer here at the OCLC Research Library Partnership, and Jan uh, is the Service Lead for Research Information Management Systems at the University of Minnesota. So I want to provide a little bit of context uh, leading up to this report. We've been looking at research information management practices for a while here and at OCLC Research, and we've had three reports to date on this. The one that you see circled uh, is the most recent one, and it was also a survey that we conducted with Eurochris related to practices and patterns in research information management. Uh, what we really wanted was to get a get sort of almost a comparative view of what was happening across the landscape. Uh, the challenge was we got a great sample from Australia, from the Netherlands, from the UK, from parts of Europe, and we had a lousy sample from the United States. Uh, and so um, we sort of circled back and said, okay, survey is not the methodology that's going to work for us to understand what's happening here uh, for lots of reasons that, you know, I encourage you to sort of reflect upon as, as I present today, because I, I think that, that, you know, the, the, the number of uses and the confusing nomenclature, these are all things that sort of contribute to the fact that people might not be responding to a survey. They may not realize it's even for them. So instead, uh, I circle back and we have developed a case study approach, really providing an in-depth analysis of the REM practices at five case study institutions that you see here, Penn State, Texas A&M, Virginia Tech, UCLA, and the University of Miami. We selected these uh, these five institutions because they're, um, they gave us a view of a, of a lot of different things. They were diverse in the products that they were using. They were diverse in the uses or the reasons, you know, the use cases they were using. Um, they were, they had, um, they exemplified RIM systems at different scale, maybe part of the institution, maybe for the entire institution, and, and maybe even, uh, at a system wide or at a state, even a state sort of scale. So that was also really something we wanted to have a have a look at. And they also represented a broad diversity of stakeholders. So we we weren't trying to look at just library led initiatives. We wanted to really look at at, at a broad array of things. And so contacting these five institutions, we conducted semi-structured interviews with 39 individuals at eight institutions. Uh, and so who, who, is, who is the we here? It certainly was Jan and me. Jan actually, uh, we sort of served as co-PIs on this project and Jan actually spent uh, three months of her sabbatical over the spring working on this report as sort of uh, sort of the co-PI on this project. But we've had wonderful involvement and engagement uh, and partnership with the other three people listed here. From the US, we have Brenna Helmstetler from Syracuse University and David Scherer from Carnegie Mellon University. And then also we continued to have uh, input from Eurochris through Pablo de Castro, who works at Strathclyde University in, in Scotland, but is also a longstanding member of the Eurochris board and the Eurochris community, who uh, provides uh, sort of useful insight for us from, from a different lens. So this was our project team uh, and um, we, we are all joint authors on this report. Um, what I want to emphasize is that we will be having a report coming out next month 
uh, in two parts. Uh, the first part's really the synthesis, the findings, and the recommendations, with the second part being the in-depth case studies. It's much longer. It's much more detailed. It's much richer. It's really the evidence that helped us develop the shorter first part. So, in a nutshell, we really want you to read the first part, uh, but we encourage you to sort of dip in to the second part. Uh, if you have questions or if you really want to see and practice, you know, what this looks like in an institution, that's why we pro provided that additional context. It's the evidence that informed part one. So, in addition to that, uh, we're going to be blogging in at least a five part series, perhaps more. The five parts are already written that are going to be appearing in the OCLC research blog, Hanging Together. And so, if you aren't already uh, a subscriber to Hanging Together, or if you don't already follow us, I believe that a link will be showing up in the chat shortly, inviting you to do that. Uh, and that's the, that blog series is going to be, uh, you know, really my intention with that is that this is a way for you to, um, for us to amplify certain parts of the report, to go into depth in some other parts that we weren't, we just didn't feel needed to live as part of the report, uh, and um, for us to, to, to also maybe be a way for you in a library situation to perhaps also share something of interest to other members of your community, whether it's a research leader or something. So it's it's just lots of different ways to access this information. We're gonna be presenting at Educause. We've previously presented at Vivo and, and Eurochris. Uh, hopefully we'll be presenting at CNI this fall. And we're gonna be uh, also presenting additional webinars on this topic, discussions, and there's going to be sort of more that we encourage you to engage with. So continue to watch our RLP listservs for more information about ways that you within the Research Library Partnership can specifically engage on this topic. I wanna mention five goals that this project hopes to deliver on. First, you know, the starter goal is to really emphasize and examine how the US is different from those in Europe, Australia, New Zealand, uh, UK, et cetera, because um, we use a lot of terminology. Sometimes we use the same type terminology, but, but frankly, our, our, our ecosystem is, is just developing rapidly differently. Um, uh, to really understand an array of use cases and to unite them under sort of one common umbrella uh, for, for reasons that I'll talk about a little bit more here in a minute, uh, to offer recommendations to institutional leaders that, of course, includes library leaders, but also because research information management is an enterprise effort. We really tailored this report, not just for libraries, but really to the entire research community. And that's why I think it's really important that in the orange box that a theme throughout the report is demonstrating the central role of the library. We found the library engaged as a stakeholder across all of the use cases. Uh, and we want to be able to articulate both in the report and in some of, you know, some of the forthcoming blog posts, how important the library is and the skills that librarians have for supporting research information management. And finally, we are interested in, in meeting some of our goals as OCLC research to accelerate collaboration and innovation by encouraging movement toward a vendor agnostic community of practice. Here in the US, we currently have um, some very strong sort of user group communities like the North American Pure User Group. Um, Digital Science similarly has a strong user group, Vivo as well. And there, you know, there are other examples there. Uh, but we, we really want to advocate for uh, collaboration across vendor uh, vendor communities uh, uh, so that there's more sharing across that space. So what I'm going to talk about next are uh, some of the use cases that we identified. And I want to emphasize that there are multiple use cases because when you have lots of different drivers, you have a lot of different stakeholders and you have a really highly autonomous and decentralized ecosystem, which 
is American higher ed, you're going to end up with a lot of silos. So you're actually going to have a lot of different uses. Uh, and um, you're often going to have folks working separately. So what we found uh, in our study was that this is actually very much true. So this, this is a quick snapshot of our five case study institutions and the um, sort of REM systems that we documented in our study. And so you can see for three of the institutions, we documented three separate related systems. For two of the institutions, we only documented uh, one system each. Uh, what's kind of interesting to look at is that all of these red circled uh, um, implementations really relate to uh, public, what, what I'll talk about in a minute is a public portal use case. It's some sort of uh, reputation management or expertise discovery support for, um, to, to expose the research of the institution. That's at least one of the use cases there. The dotted line here for Virginia Tech means that it's in development. It hasn't launched yet, but it will be shortly. So, uh, same for uh, scholarship at Miami is that the full public profiles have not yet fully launched. So in development, but definitely still documented in our report. Moving forward, you can also see here in the blue is that we have two case studies here, uh, two, two, two systems that are primarily focused on faculty activity reporting, really annual review and or promotion and tenure processes. Now, what I'll also add is, oh, we meant three. There's also Virginia Tech. So Penn State, Virginia Tech, and UCLA. So there's three of those there. Um, we have, there's two institutions that don't have a blue circle. That doesn't mean they don't do faculty activity reporting. It means that at the time that we're writing this report, they don't do so in a centralized way, which is probably true for a lot of your institutions. Uh, and so we didn't include them in the report, but the because there were probably still multiple systems to examine and there just wasn't a strong return on our investment of time for that. But we documented at least three of these systems. And then finally, we also documented two systems that are primarily about supporting open access policies and workflows that make uh, open access deposit, open access compliance with open access mandates by the institution at Penn State and UCLA, making them the most convenient for these institutions. And so this was in some ways sort of a surprising use case that we also documented. So here are the six use cases that we identified. I'm gonna quickly provide an overview of these. Um, the first one uh, is faculty activity reporting. Uh, and um, we, and we, let me just say that we also group all of these together, which I'll talk about in a, in a moment, un, under sort of a central umbrella, because they tend to be collecting a lot of the same information. And that's why we feel like it's very useful to look at these through the same lens. So for faculty activity reporting, it's some sort of system that is collecting information about publications, outputs, uh, grants, et cetera, for annual review of faculty and or promotion and tenure. The second uh, use case we identified is the one probably most well known in the United States, which is the public portal, uh, which is really about exposing the research of the institution to support the reputation of both uh, the institution and its researchers and or to support expertise discovery, often to support team science. Uh, and, and creation of, of interdisciplinary uh, scientific teams. Um, metadata reuse, uh, obviously, if you've collected this information, wouldn't it be great to have a way to maybe through an API to also update a faculty web page or a departmental web page? That's, that's a case of uh, metadata reuse. And a, maybe a specific type of metadata reuse is really strategic reporting and decision support. We treat it separately because it requires more granularity of data. It requires uh, it 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 requires uh, often use of visualizations. Um, there's higher uh, need 
there's differences in how the data must be structured. So um, we've separated this out to look at it separately, even though you might also think of it as a type of metadata reuse. The open access workflow, as I said, with Penn State and UCL, UCLA is, is related to those institutions implementation of an open access policy and then development of a system to help facilitate the um, metadata capture uh, and identify, identification of, uh, of, of publications that then could be, uh, and then to support the, the deposit of those works into the campus repository as green open access to be, you know, to, to be compliant with, with the institutional open access policy. And the last use case is compliance monitoring. It's a really tiny part of what we see in the US, even though if you compare it to Europe, UK, Australia, that's the main use case. But for us, it's this really tiny part, because as you can see, if you look at UCLA and look across, so we have the same organization here across of these use cases, you can see that we only saw this compliance monitoring use case at UCLA, and, in, and I'll say in a very constrained way, very, very small way. Uh, whereas if we were documenting European institutions, we would see that probably check all the way up. So this is a bit of a, a different way of presenting um, the, the slides that I presented with the, the red, green, and blue circles. What I want to emphasize here is that in the rest of this presentation, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the um, implementations at Penn State, Virginia Tech, and UCLA. So just a note about compliance monitoring. There's a lot more that I can say about this, and I, I will. I have a blog post that we're going to post later this fall and hanging together about why is this so different in the US. Uh, but also, we want to say that we think there's a lot more that could be done in this area is that, you know, even though there's no external research assessment exercise in the US that's really driving compliance monitoring, we think that open access and open science mandates, uh, particularly coming from federal agencies, as well as um, non federal funders, like the Gates Foundation are really going to require much more monitoring. Uh, but what we're seeing is that this monitoring is often not happening in RIM systems, but this is actually really what in the European sense they were designed to do. So we really want to sort of encourage you to be thinking about, are there folks on your campus who also care about this? Because it could be a way to add efficiency to your institution and to advocate for increasing value for the library. So here's one of our goals is really to unite diverse practices. Um, we offer a definition in our report that research information management systems support the transparent aggregation, curation, and utilization of data about institutional research activities. So this includes a lot of uh, different kinds of nomenclature that we use. This includes things like research networking systems. This includes the term researcher or research profile system, expert finder systems includes those sorts of public, you know, profile sort of systems. We also think this definition really also embraces European practice, like a CRIS system, uh, yeah, as well as our workflows related to faculty activity reporting because they are aggregating, curating, and utilizing data about the institutional footprint. What I want to emphasize also is that this is intended to be institutional, is that there are other systems that may aggregate this information. I'm sort of thinking about ResearchGate, but they're really not done in a way that is intentionally and, and or reusable about the institution. And so uh, it's really institutionally focused. And this means that this umbrella definition of RIM that we're putting forward embraces a lot of practices. It also embraces a lot of different products and it embraces a lot of different stakeholders. And so starting from the upper right, you see products like Elsevier's Pure, Digital Sciences Elements, which are sort of the leaders in this domain, really come out of the European CRIS environment, sort of also come from, from more of a publishing sector type activity. You see products developing in that area. 
On the left, you see products that have been developed, often coming out of HR or academic affairs, really supporting faculty activity reporting, but they're collecting a lot of the same information, but they're usually managed by somebody else on, on campus and these groups may not be talking. We see products like uh, Profiles RNS and Vivo that are open source products that, are, that have been seeded by the National Institutes of Health in the United States that really have a, a public portal sort of mission to provide expertise, discovery, and reputation management for institutions. And then we also see a new entrant with Ex Libris's Esploro, which, which is also represents sort of a, what we're seeing is some merging of institutional repositories and RIM systems. And this is an interesting example of that. And we are looking at this, this sort of new entry uh, with the University of Miami case study. And then of course, finally, there are homegrown solutions as well. But our point is that all of these constitute RIM practice and that there will be a lot of benefits to us as a community if we think of them in this way. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jan and she's going to provide some comments about um, uh, the RIM system framework. So Jan, I believe you're a presenter now. Okay, thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, so when we were writing up these case studies with all these different things going on, different use cases, we found that we needed a common language to describe the components of each of the systems. It's one thing to say that an institution licenses elements or pure or uses Vivo, but that's only part of what they're doing to keep their system running. We came up with this framework. And let's see if I can move my slides. There we go. Uh, we came up with this framework. It starts at the top with the data sources, and then it flows down through a data store to the consumers of the data that fulfill the use cases that Rebecca described. Now, not every use case, not every case study has or needs each of these components. And as we applied the framework, we described what the system actually does, not what the products they, uh, they license offer, but what that institution is actually using. Let's start at the top. We describe three kinds of data sources. We consider research outputs to be the core of the RIM systems, and the bulk of those research outputs are publications. The RIM systems use metadata and databases and indexes that are either freely available or licensed by the institution. The other major source of data is local. Most of the systems use the institution's HR system to identify the employees that'll be included and their affiliations and other information about them that's kept at the institutional level. Awarded grants and courses taught are typically coming from existing internal data sources. And then there's local knowledge. Unfortunately, not all of the data you might wanna have in a RIM system is readily available in another local system. We're thinking here about information individuals might enter for themselves like research statements, as well as information about centers and institutions and who's affiliated with them. More than one of the institutions we studied had no documented organizational hierarchy that could be pulled from one of those local data sources. The RIM system really became the first complete documentation of those relationships. Now we'll move on to data processing. Once the sources are identified, they need to be transformed into a single database that can be used to meet the use cases. Getting the publications into a single database is often the biggest lift. There's no one database that has all the publications for all the researchers at an institution and persistent identifiers, they aren't used as consistently as we might like quite yet. Also the publication databases themselves are subject to changing web services and structures. So most RIM systems rely on a publication harvester to pull candidate publications from one or more databases based on what's known about each author. We identified four different publication harvesters in the case studies, Symplectic Elements, Elsevier Pure, Ex Libris Esploro, and the Profiles RNS Author Disambiguation Engine. Although preferred publication databases vary by discipline, they don't vary a lot by institution. The same cannot be said for HR systems, grant tracking systems, and course systems. Even institutions that were using the same software will implement it differently. And that's where ETL processes come in. 
ETL stands for extract, transform, load, and it's where a lot of an institution's developers spend a lot of their time. You might have also heard them called crosswalks. Well, some institutions rely on data analysts who just occasionally extract data from the local sources and run queries and other processes to get the data into the RIM system. Uh, automating those ensures that the RIM system's data is currently and current and accurately reflects the institution's records. In other words, if you're planning a RIM system, we suggest you plan for an analyst and developer time to fit into the to fit the internal metadata for purpose. Moving down to the metadata editor, no matter how much you automate, there's always going to be a need for, a, for an editor. This is where you review everything that came in from the data sources through the processes above, and also where you enter local or even individual level information that isn't stored anywhere else. And now we get to the data store. The data store might be a licensed product or a custom database developed, hosted, and maintained by the institution. The data transfer methods are the various methods used to extract the data from the data store. In most cases, the system had a web service or as well as tools for exporting and reporting. And some also have ways of querying the data store directly using SQL, structured query language. The items on this bottom layer refer back to the RIM use cases. As we, we review the case studies, you're gonna see versions of this framework for each system we covered. If a use case is met by the system, it's listed on this layer. We're gonna talk about three of our five case studies here, starting with Penn State. Penn State is a large institution with 24 campuses across Pennsylvania and a total enrollment of around 90,000. We explored three different systems that meet different use cases. Elsevier Pure is managed by the research office and the medical college, including its library. Activity Insight is managed by the library. And the Researcher Metadata Database, managed by the library, incorporates data from both of those. Altogether, the three systems meet almost all the RIM use cases that we identified. Here's how we applied that RIM framework for Activity Insight. Note that there's no publication harvester. Individuals and their delegates enter their own information, and they do import information from various databases. This is just not an automated way to give them suggestions. A team of library staff members also support faculty members, both answering questions and entering data from their CVs. The framework for Penn State's PURE system is mostly fewer, filled by PURE. Uh, the automatic scope of speed comes through the profile refinement service, which is a curation service from Elsevier. People can also import from other publication databases. And down at the bottom of the framework, the portal is a pure component also. The two systems together feed into the researcher metadata database, which is a recent addition. Moving on to Virginia Tech, Virginia Tech is a public research institution with about 37,000 students. Uh, they rely heavily on a single licensed product for the RIM system, its elements. And in an excellent example of both technical and social interoperability, the administrative responsibility for that system is shared across three entities. One thing we particularly noted, publication metadata is seen as an institutional asset. Among other things, this means that the publication metadata is stored in a university data commons where it's governed centrally like other types of institutional data. And it's available for budgeting and other institutional analysis purposes. Although it's made up of multiple pieces, they're connected under one umbrella and meet most of the use cases we identified. The public portal, as Rebecca mentioned, is scheduled to roll out this fall. Faculty members can already deposit open access versions of their publications uh, into the institutional repository from Elements and a robust open access workflow is under consideration. The RIM framework for elements at Virginia Tech shows the elements product as the publication harvester, the metadata editor, and a data transfer method. Elements acts as a data store, but the data in elements is also fed into the university data commons, which then acts as the data store for the data source for strategic planning. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Rebecca to talk about UCLA. 
Okay, so um, UCLA is the most complex of the 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 um, case studies that we we studied uh, because great part because it's the largest institution. Uh, it uh, enrolls. Um, more than 250,000 students. Uh, it's comprised of 10 large uh, research campuses. Uh, and in the course of our study, we actually talked to and examined practices at the UCLA campus, but also at the larger University of California system, and particularly related to the efforts of the California Digital Library. So, like at Penn State, at UCLA, we documented three distinct systems. The first one is Opus, Opus slash Interfolio. Uh, and uh, there really sort of are two parts to this. Uh, Opus uh, is really the homegrown system for faculty information, and it supports faculty activity reporting as well as promotion and tenure. So it does so as a combination of the homegrown Opus basically the data store, along with components from the vended product uh, offered by, by Interfolio. Uh, the UC publication management system is, is something actually I expect most of people in our audience are already familiar with, because uh, this has been developed to support uh, the 2013 and following open access policies impacting first faculty and then all the other researchers across the 10 campus uh, University of California system. Uh, it uses uh, uh, symplectic elements for metadata harvesting, and it as well is managed uh, centrally by the California Digital Library. And then the final system that we looked at is uh, UCLA profiles, which uh, represents sort of a part of just the UCLA campus, because it offers uh, public profiles for biomedical researchers only, at UCLA using the open source profiles RNS product uh, developed by Harvard University. Uh, and actually what's interesting also is that it's managed by the TCSI at both UCLA and at the University of California, San Francisco. So lots of lots of different sorts of things happening with the California case study. What you can see is looking at this, we have uh, representation across those three uh, systems of all of the use cases we identified in, in, our, in our study. So using, and using a variety of different products, homegrown, a FAR product, um, combination of homegrown, as well as elements, open source, all sorts of sort of different components there as well. And as Jan talked about, uh, we we document uh, the uh, RIM system framework for all three of these, but I'm only going to share one of them today in the interest of time, because we'll have we'll have I think we're going to have adequate time for some Q and A at the end. So I encourage you uh, to put some questions in the chat, and we can get to those. So uh, what you can see here from the UC publication management system is that. It uh, relies upon uh, HR data from 10, 10 campuses uh, to collect information about who are the people who are, you know, are under the open access policy. And then it uses uh, the uh, elements publication harvester to collect information, the metadata really related to help support what are, what are the, um, what are the publications el eligible for open access deposit for green open access? And then furthermore, you can see throughout more use of elements as the metadata editor, as the data store, and then also to transfer to other systems from the elements API, and then um, to support the variety of use cases. And there is some reuse uh, as well, documented fully in, in our forthcoming report. One of the things I want to emphasize about this report, and this is the, the last short section of our presentation before we have Q&A, is that we offer recommendations for institutional leaders. And as Jan, uh, and um, what we really have here is these six recommendations. Uh, the first one, I'm going to spend a moment talking through these. The first one really is 
that if, if you want to have good data, if you want to have data that's reusable and that can support multiple use cases, you must invest in institutional data curation. Or said in other ways, good metadata doesn't just happen. Uh, so, uh, and, and that actually requires, you know, really relying upon expertise that's available in the library. Only the library is going to be the unit on campus that's going to have the expertise related to uh, the publication information. Uh, a good part of having of investing in in quality data is supporting adoption of persistent identifiers. This, of course, includes DOIs. It includes uh, ORCIDs. It includes ROARs. Uh, and really, you know. It shouldn't just be the library that is supporting the adoption of persistent identifiers. It is an institutional, it is of institutional importance. So that's one of our another a second of our recommendation for institutional leaders. We also emphasize that it's important not to expect a turnkey system. And for for myself and for others who have had the responsibility for implementing a RIM system, this probably um, probably speaks to you. Um, because uh, it can actually be pretty easy to get a, a room system up and going if you're using a vended product. But that's if the data that you're using, you know, about your institutional hierarchies or being able to find all of your faculty is clean. And uh, oftentimes it is not as easy as we think it is to identify who are all your tenure line faculty. What are your research institutes? Uh, shocking, but uh, these are the things that can make uh, implementation really difficult. And we wanted to, to express that these things really will slow your process down. We believe it's really important that RIM implementations uh, involve cross-functional teams. And uh, that means people with a variety of different skills. You, you're gonna need folks with IT skills. You're gonna need folks with project management skills. You're gonna fo need folks with metadata skills, as well as communication and marketing skills. Uh, and you're also gonna need uh, folks who know about the data from other parts of campus. So our team-based approach is really essential for success. And it's also, imperative that there are dedicated personnel that that who have uh, all our parts of their job related to this. And um, and that's also something we saw in previous report that uh, many institutions, at least in Europe, will have at least two dedicated people in these roles. And that's not something we see as much of in the US. Uh, but if again, you want to have a robust system, with a strong return on investment, you need to invest in dedicated personnel. And finally, looking at what we thought was an exemplary example from Virginia Tech, it's really valuable to include research information and in enterprise data governance efforts. Our institutions have long histories of uh, taking great care with student information, with academic history information, and of course for reasons because you know we award degrees. Uh, but what we're arguing in our report is that research information, the information about the, the institution's output, because it can be now be collected in this way, is also uh, an institutional asset and it should be treated as such. And so that is also one of our key recommendations. What you'll see throughout this is that libraries are essential partners in research information management. Through all of these things, I think it's very important to see that the library is a key stakeholder and has much to offer and that implementations really should not be done without also including the libraries. So with that, uh, I believe uh, I am concluded with my comments. We have close to 20 minutes for discussion. Yes. And Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, Jan. Um, I'm going to invite at this point, we've got uh, lots of wonderful information that Rebecca and Jan have shared with us. Um, I'm gonna imagine it might take a little, little while to process, but now that we've got some time with Rebecca and Jan, um, if you want to dig into any of the details about some of the things that they've shared, um, here's a good opportunity. So go ahead and put comments, questions into chat, uh, just here in your chat box. Now make sure that option is set to send to everyone so that we can see your questions and we look forward to, to discussing um, your comments and your questions with you.
Uh, but while folks are, are mulling over the kinds of things they might want to be discussing with you, I thought I might start out um, Jan and Rebecca with a, a question, um, some questions uh, that I've got here uh, that I'd like to ask you. And, you know, I, I just, I'm curious to know, as you were doing this work, was there anything in particular that surprised you um, over the course of this study? Um, and I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I can take a crack at that one. So Thanks, Jan. Jan. And uh, yeah, for me, I was a little surprised at how, how often we saw the open access workflow use case being discussed. I knew about what the University of California was doing, but I was interested to see that Penn State also is, is uh, doing an open access workflow to help people get their publications into uh, a repository or to make sure that they're open access. Virginia Tech is also planning that. It seemed to be much more in everyone's mind than I knew it was, having just talking to people within my own subset of the RIM community. Um, so I found that surprising. There, there's another thing that I wanted to mention, though, something that I, it didn't surprise me, but it surprised me how easy the evidence was to come up with about how important metadata is in this whole discussion. Um, in fact, at one point, as Rebecca and I were figuring out what are, how are we going to group these different things we're seeing into uh, discrete use cases, at one point I had them ordered by the level of metadata you, you would need in order to do this thing. Um, for a public portal, you don't really need to have a, each citation broken up into its discrete parts. But if you're going to do any strategic reporting, you definitely need that. So it became pretty easy to make that argument that you need to pay, pay attention to more than just the breadth of what you're covering, but also to uh, the granularity of, of what you're collecting and how you're storing it. Thanks, Jan. That was um, really interesting to hear your, your insights on that. Um, let's see, Rebecca, I didn't know if you have any other comments on that, or we do have a question that we could get to here from one of our attendees. So, a um, couple of our questions. No additional comments to me from me on that, that okay. question. Okay, sure thing. All right, so we have a, a comment and a question here from Laura Bredal. Um, I hope I'm saying that correctly. So uh, Laura says, thanks for the very timely presentation. I have a question about the at least two dedicated staff uh, that you um, mentioned in your recommendation or mentioned as you were discussing your recommendations. Do you have a sense of any trends in the skills that these staff uh, have had and where in the institution that they sat? Yeah, um, this is covered in the practices and pa patterns report. So this is information we gleaned from that 2018 publication. I'm afraid that right off the top of my head, I'm not able to easily answer your question, but I know that it's living in that report. Um, my vague memory is that it definitely includes folks who are um, sort of managing the system who uh, have um, helped to ensure that profiles are complete, that uh, information is validated, uh, that each publication is validated, that support the workflows, that deal with help desk tickets. Uh, and then also that there, of course, is usually some sort of IT process because there is also, as Jan talked about, that need for um, sort of the ETL, there's always the crosswalking, there's always to the make sure that your systems are being updated regularly. So I think that those are two key things, um, but I really think that the, the, the skills needed are, are really um, broader than just those two categories. Thanks, Rebecca. And again, that's a um, useful pointer to you know dig into the reports when, when they come out uh, for, for some of those kinds of details. So another question that's come up. Uh, so Stratton Meyer is asking, could you could could you speak to more to the involvement of libraries in this process? Is it simply as a resource repository, or are there dedicated library systems uh, that could be helpful in RIM? I can take this, but Jan, did, maybe you want to. Uh, why don't you start, Rebecca? And I, I have some ideas I may add. Okay. Um, what I'm really advocating for is that 
that RIM is a valuable place for library skills. I think that there are both skills and values that the library holds that nobody else on campus has that are really essential for making the most of research information management systems. The key part of that is being expertise with publications metadata. Uh, no one else on campus has that information. Nobody else can easily answer, why are we not getting humanities metadata? Why isn't this easily harvestable? Uh, you know, why, you know, there are things that I think that we understand about the publication workflow, about scholarly communication that are just frankly absent uh, at other parts of campus and so are intensely needed when a great part of what you're trying to collect and aggregate is actually the publications information. So for me, it's really about advocating uh, about the skills and for then the library to also be involved um, in not only sharing its information and this expertise, but also being a real partner in the adoption, implementation, and maintenance of, of RIM systems, as well as thinking about their interoperability with other systems that may include, um, you know, your grants administration system. It may include, um, of course, you know, uh, uh, you know, faculty activity reporting, which I would argue is also a RIM system, but all of those things so that there's increasing interoperability and so that there's also less redundancy of effort and less burden on faculty. Uh, Jan, do you have more to say? Well, you checked off just about everything. I <laughs> pretty much everything I was going to say. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, as Rebecca said, nobody knows publication data like librarians know publication data. Uh, both the, the metadata itself and then just the flow of information. And that is something I find myself explaining a lot in my own role. Uh, you know, why do we, why can't I just say, give me all the publications for 2020 on January 1st, 2021? Well, <laughs> you know, there are reasons. And, and uh, um, I, I think that, that we bring that level of being able to explain it to other people as well as the curation skills. Um, I think that there, uh, there, if you really wanna do strategic reporting and decision support, for example, you really need to have good, reliable, uh, current metadata and librarians uh, have the skills to to bring that uh, to the table. Um, and yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. One additional thing I'll add with that is that that's, I, I think also one of the reasons it's really important to include faculty activity reporting within uh, this landscape. Um, oh, and one thing that actually did surprise me was that we found libraries that were um, that were the maintainers of the faculty activity reporting workflows, which was definitely the case at Penn State, and then to a lesser extent at Virginia Tech, where it's shared. That was really interesting to me, and that was sort of unexpected because I think there were we heard from other libraries are saying, "Oh no, we have a firewall. We don't want anything to do with that." Uh, and so we saw both perspectives there, but I think that this, um, you know, the faculty activity reporting and PNT processes may be the closest thing to a stick <laughs> that we have with faculty. But the challenge often is that those systems, because they're often designed for, they were usually not designed with reporting in mind or with reuse. Uh, is that the data is often not uh, fielded. It, um, it, there are multiple records for multiple authors of the same publication. So there are all sorts of challenges there. And I think that, um, that having the involvement of the library, and we see this in the Penn State case study, I think very clearly, because they actually dedicate resources to help faculty who are going up to, for promotion and tenure to provide uh, data entry into the activity insight system. So not only, I mean, it's a service that's highly valued by faculty, but it's also a service that provides quality, well-formatted metadata that then can have uh, greater, um, greater impact, greater usability uh, throughout its life cycle. 
Thanks, Rebecca and Jan. I think pulling out all the important ways that uh, libraries are uniquely positioned to, to help with um, this work and the unique set of skills um, expertise they bring. That's um, I, I like how you hit hit all the points there. So uh, thanks for summing summing that all up for us. Uh, I have another question from this is from Laura Mullen. In terms of futures thinking, what do you see as the future of institutional repositories individually or, and or in the collective in research libraries? Jan, you want me to take this one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I, I'll start with that. We also address this in the practices and patterns report. Uh, and actually, in this case, uh, I think it's very useful to look at what is already occurring in the European landscape, uh, because I think it can provide us with insights for what may also um, occur here in the United States. In, in Europe, we've had stronger um, open access mandates coming from Plan S, uh, coming sort of from some you know national efforts such as you know they've been really strong for in the Netherlands for instance, uh, and and also the desire to not only make all publications, all journal articles, open access and data as well, uh, but also to uh, track. How are we doing on that goal? What percentages do we have? And, and to do that, you need the functionality both of a, of a repository as well as the functionality of a RIM system to do all the sort of additional sort of compliance sort of monitoring sorts of things. And so that's a long way of me getting to the say is we're seeing some merging of these categories, these, these sort of systems or the way that they're being used. Um, both to make uh, open access uh, deposits uh, more convenient. So, you know, you see people actually depositing into the repository um, in, in many institutions in Europe, but also in, um, you know, for instance, in the UC uh, publication management system, you can do that actually through the workflow in elements. And so, um, uh, um, so I think that it's likely that we're going to see more merging. Uh, and I think that that Exploro is sort of an interesting example of this. I was also, I've been, been noticing that uh, KUSE, which is a product that um, supports uh, research administration. They've also um, are uh, now offering their own repository product. But when I look at that more, I see it's actually sort of a blended RIM IR product. It's actually being marketed not to the library community. It's actually being marketed to um, the research administration committee community. I think that's actually very interesting. Uh, and so I just think it's going to be really interesting to say. I don't. I think we'll continue to see the need for stronger coupling of the uses of these two systems. So I definitely get believe we're going to see workflow uh, uh, strengthening. In, uh, uh, and 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 I think we'll see some consolidation into sort of a single uh, uh, enterprise type system as well. Jan, would you add anything? Uh, yeah, I guess I would add. You know, first of all, of course, we are seeing that consolidation, and it was really fascinating to see Esploro in the directions that it that it is now going uh, with Ex Libris is now going with that product, and also just. If you look at any of the products that were on the market, say, five years ago and what they look like now, you can see that all of them are branching out a little bit and looking at all of these use cases and how could our product meet all of them. Um, what Rebecca just uh, just alluded to uh, with uh, Cayuse, I think, is especially interesting for us as librarians to think about uh, why we need to be at the table as these decisions are being made, even if the vendor is not coming to the libraries. These systems, no matter what, are going to have to talk to each other if, uh, if if the institution really wants to get full value out of them, and that's going to mean early being in there early in the conversations. Um, we have probably all seen situations where your institution has chosen a product and you know how to work with it, and your the product you already use may or may not uh, play nicely. So. Uh, being involved early, I think, is very important, whether or not the libraries ends up being the uh, entity managing the system. 
Thanks, uh, Rebecca and Jan for that. Appreciate really all the additional um, insights and information that you were sharing just now. Wanted to just maybe pause and see if there are any other questions in just the final minute or so here, but not seeing anything. Um, I think I will wrap us up, let folks maybe just have a minute or two uh, before their next commitment. Uh, but just wanted to thank you, Rebecca, Jan, thanks for your insights, sharing the recommendations. Um, I'm excited about this basically sneak peek that we've gotten uh, about the reports. So just as a reminder to everyone, the reports will be coming out next month and I've put in uh, uh, the list to subscribe. Uh, a link to subscribe to the list so that you can uh, stay posted, uh, stay up to date on when those reports are going to be released. Um, thank you for joining us today um, and for engaging with us through your wonderful um, questions and comments here. And following uh, this webinar, as we've processed the recording, uh, we will be making that recording available. I will be sending a follow-up email along with some resource links, the link to see the uh, webinar uh, recording. And um, of course, just stay tuned for those uh, reports to come out. Um, and again, thanks for such a wonderful uh, presentation today, Rebecca and Jan, and to all of you. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks for joining and um, looking forward to keeping posted on this um, on this work. Thanks all.